Greetings, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to this virtual service for Congregation Shire Yeshua. Uh, if you would all please uh, join me in the Barhu, the Shema, and the Vahavta, but first a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, thank you for this Arab Shabbat. Lord God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord God. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, revealing yourself through your word, speaking to us, Lord, the fact that you listen to us, billions of people on the planet, yet you take time to individually listen to each one who calls out your name, Lord. It's just truly amazing the love you have for us. And I thank you for that. I ask that you would give our leaders wisdom and guidance, and Lord, uh, just cause us all to grow in you and to hear from you this evening. In Yeshua's name, amen. Baruch Adonai HaVarach. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Baruch Adonai HaVarach Le'olam Ba'ed. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, forever and ever. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kuvod Mahachoto Le'olam Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious majesty, forever and ever. Va'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol levavka uv'kol nafshecha uv'kol modecha. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, asher anochim mitzavcha hayom alevavecha, v'shinan tam levenecha v'divar tabam. V'shivtecha b'metecha uv'leftecha v'derek, u'shapacha uv'chomecha. Ukshartam la od ayadecha, vahayu la tota pot ben anecha, uktav tam amuzazot betecha, uvisharecha. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall speak of them when you are sitting at home, when you go on a journey, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign on your hand. And they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. You shall inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Amen and Shema Shalom. Tonight's drash is from Numbers 22-25-9. through 25, 9. It tells the story within this passage of Balak and Balaam. Balak was the king of Moab, which was east of the Dead Sea. And Balaam was a seer, seer, pseudo-prophet from Mesopotamia near the Euphrates. Balak had seen the Israelites encamped around Moab and he was terrified of them. So he sent for Balaam to say a curse over Israel. He thought this would help his cause. Balaam was reluctant to come, but eventually he did come. And God was kind of angry at him for this. And on the way, he sent an angel, and Balaam's donkey saw the angel, but Balaam didn't. And finally, God opened the mouth of the donkey to talk to Balaam, and Balaam was able to see the angel. Balaam was not an Israelite, and his heart wasn't right with God, but he was able to hear God through his Holy Spirit, and even through the donkey. Though Balak promised Balaam much and was persistent in his asking, Balaam did not curse Israel, but rather blessed them on three occasions. Contained within this passage is the verse that I wanted to focus on, which was Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not a man who lies or a son of man who changes his mind. Does he speak and not do it or promise and not fulfill it? Jeff often says that God is a free agent. He could choose to be whatever he wanted to be. And I'm so grateful and it's so comforting that he's chosen to be a God that doesn't lie, a God who doesn't change his mind, a God is, who is faithful even when I'm faithless. So just think of any passage in the Bible that you take as a promise from God. I like John 640. It says, it is my Father's will that those who look to Yeshua and trust in him will have eternal life and Yeshua will raise them up at the last day. God's not going to change his mind about that. 
He's not going to lie about that. He will fulfill that. If I look to Yeshua and trust in him, I will have eternal life. And Yeshua will raise me up at the last day.
Let's begin in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, Lord, speak to us through your word. Lord, I ask that you would speak to me, that you would uh, have me hear what you want me to hear from your word, that you would also place your words inside my mouth and cause them to come forth so that everyone might hear your words. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, I uh, apologize that we are meeting virtually. Unfortunately, uh, I've... Uh, several members of the congregation that I also am under the weather and so we're doing this virtually but um, I'd like to uh, give a, a brief talk this evening about truth and uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of things that come about uh, with the word truth and so I'm just going to get right down to it and begin in 1 Samuel chapter 12 beginning in verse 20. Samuel said to the people fear not Indeed, you have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following Adonai, but worship Adonai with all your heart. Do not turn aside to go after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are futile. For Adonai will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased Adonai to make you a people to himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me if I should sin against Adonai by ceasing to pray for you. Yet I'll keep instructing you in the good and straight way. Only fear Adonai and worship him in truth with all your heart, considering how magnificently he has dealt with you. But if you persist in acting wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. So, the real question is, if we're supposed to be worshiping, fearing Adonai and worshiping in truth, what is truth? That's very easily stated in John chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. Yeshua himself declared himself to be the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Yeshua said he is the truth. And we also know that in 1 John, or that in John, sorry, in John chapter 1, that it has some more descriptions of Yeshua. And we'll go ahead and read those. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him, and apart from him, nothing was made that has come into being. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. This is talking about Yeshua. So Yeshua is truth, and Yeshua is the Word. The Word of God. And he's been there. He's been there from the beginning. He was involved in creation, and he was willing to humble himself and become obedient to death on a stake and then stay underground for three days or in the ground for three days in the tomb for three days and then be resurrected defeating death and providing a way for all of us to have life with God again and that's what this is about 
Now you'll notice that the word, he says, that in him was light, and that light was the life of men. As a matter of fact, Psalm 119 says, um, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So I'm going to tell you something right now. And this applies to me, it applies to you. But if we are not walking in God's word, which is truth, if we are not walking in truth, his word is not providing a light, that means we're walking in darkness. And that's a very serious place to be. Now, Jeff uh, was going through Bible studies a while ago on uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. And part of that was Solomon and his request for wisdom, or understanding, as we know. <clears throat> Excuse me just a moment. So Solomon's request for wisdom was not Hochmar wisdom. It was actually uh, Somea, or from Shema, the root word Shema, which means to hear. He asked literally for understanding, or for a hearing heart to hear God. And I'd like to go ahead and read that, uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. So give your servant a mind of understanding to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? He recognized his place. They were God's people, and he was simply serving the Lord. Now it was pleasing in the eyes of Adonai that Solomon asked this thing, so God said to him, Because you asked for this thing, and did not ask for long life or riches, or ask for the life of your enemies, but asked for understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words, and given you a wise and discerning mind, so that there has been none like you before you, nor anyone will arise after you. So not only did he get the understanding that he asked for, the ability to listen to God, his heart to hear God's word, but he also got wisdom. Unfortunately, at times, Solomon, in his wisdom, forgot the understanding and allowed himself to be led astray by his foreign wives. But in the end, he repented of this, and we see that in his later writings. So, um, as a matter of fact, in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 3.11, God said there, the writer says, he put eternity in the heart of man, the only one who could fill eternity is the one who never ends, who is God. So, how do we focus on truth? How do we recognize truth? How do we spend time in truth? Well, uh, Colossians 3.2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Read God's word. If anything you are told is different than what is in God's word, it is wrong and it is not true. God's word is 100% truth. And that's what we have to go by. Now, we have examples. Uh, what about where the scriptures may not be 100% clear? <coughs> Excuse me. 100% clear. Um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he grew up seeing how much wisdom his dad had, but he also saw the folly of his father. In 1 Kings chapter 12, he was approached. And the tribe said, Solomon taxed us, lowered the taxes, and he went and he got counsel. And he got counsel from his father's advisors, and they said, yes, you will be loved and endeared if you lower the taxes, if you reduce this. But his younger counsel, his friends that he grew up with, said, no, you need to show them that you're king, that you're boss, that you're a bigger man than your father. And so his response was, uh, Quite interesting, if you'd like to read it, 1 Kings chapter 12. But basically, he did deny it, and he claimed to be a bigger man than his father. So, with age comes wisdom, right? So we can find God's word by just simply asking the elderly what that wisdom is. No, it still comes from God's word. We see in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not seek counsel from Adonai's mouth. So Joshua made peace with them and cut a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the community swore to them. Now this is a deception that occurred when Joshua came in. The Gibeonites took moldy bread, old bread, old wineskins, 
And they said, look, we're from a faraway place. We're not close. Let us live and we'll be servants to you. And that was allowed. That was what God told Joshua. That's fine. You can do that. So without consulting God, the Joshua and the elders, and keep in mind, Joshua's elderly at this point. They did not seek God, but instead followed the wisdom of what they saw, of their circumstances around them. And it resulted in the Gibeonites not being destroyed, as God had asked them to do. Now, they still had to honor their pledge, and they were still slaves. But that goes to show us that there is no person, no old person, no young person, who is guaranteed to have God's wisdom, except God's word alone. Now, certainly out of the mouth of babes and out of the elderly can come wisdom. And I encourage you to seek it, but you always must be judged against the word of God. Um, in Zechariah chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, again, the word of Adonai Tzvold said, uh, the fast of the fourth and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth month will become joy, gladness, and cheerful modi. Therefore, love truth and shalom. Love truth and shalom. Do you seek peace and do you love spending time in the scripture? We live in a terribly busy world where there's a lot of distractions. And it's very easy to read a devotional of somebody's opinion about the scripture. And maybe it, it covers three or four verses, but they can be taken out of context. They can be all sorts of things. So what are you doing? Are you studying to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Or are you negligent? I know at times I have been negligent. I have gotten distracted and not studied enough. And it can happen to anyone. And I don't want it to happen to you. So I'm urging you to recognize that the word of God is truth and that that truth has a mighty power because our life has so many things going on. We're coming out of the coronavirus, maybe going back into it. <clears throat> I'm sick right now. And, you know, all these things that are going on in the world, the war in Ukraine, the injustices all over the world, how do we focus? How do we spend time? How do we make enough time to study the Word of God with all that's going on around us when we have to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week? It's tough. But where your priority is, where your heart is, there your treasure is. You want to place your treasure with God. And that is in His Word. And the beautiful thing about God's Word, about the truth of God's Word, is that in John 8, 32, He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You still may be working 60 hours, life may be chaotic, but in your spirit you can be free of the worry, of the weight of everything, because you are following God's word first above everything else. Now, in supplement to this, I would like to cover just one example of a common way that people try to say that the word of God is not true. And that is Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. So if you'd like to turn there with me. But I'm going to begin at 39, sorry. Yeshua replied to them, an evil and adulterous generation <coughs> clamors for a sign. Yet no shine shall be given to it except for the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, a lot of people, and actually uh, there's a, a movement, infidels, uh, an infidel movement, or website anyway, um, that specifically points to this to say, see, the Gospels are wrong. If Yeshua was in Friday, Saturday, and part of Sunday, that is not three days and three nights. It's a lie. <coughs> and excuse me. But in Luke chapter uh, 18, it actually says something a little different. In Luke ch chapter 18, he says that he will rise 
on the third day. So which is it? Is it on the third day or is it three days and three nights? Or in Matthew chapter 28 when it says that they are, began on the first day of the week, that's Sunday. So it goes to the two. That's the third day. Now, if you were three days and three nights, you would actually be done on the fourth day because it would be a full three days and a full three nights. So what is the answer? Why does our word of truth seem to contradict itself? Well, it's quite simple. I believe in 100% accuracy of the Bible in its original context. And that's important because there are things known as idioms or phrases. Now, I worked really hard at work, and it killed me, literally, but I got it done. Right there, I used two idioms. A, it didn't kill me. And B, I used the word literally to mean not literally. Now, if I was studying that purely from a language and did not have knowledge base of English, I would say, well, that guy's completely lying. But in actuality, I'm using common phrases that mean something different than what they were. And we see examples of this in the Tanakh. As a matter of fact, in Esther chapter 4, which I'm going to turn to now, I'm going to turn to Esther chapter 4, verse 15. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are in Shushan and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast the same way. Afterwards, I will go to the king, even though it's not according to the law. And so if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai left and did all that Esther commanded him. So three days, three nights on the fourth day, she'll be going before the king, if we understand it literally in that. But if we understand idioms, it would be on the third day. What does her chapter 5 say? On the third day, Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the palace. So we see... Right there in Scripture, in the Tanakh, that this is a Hebrew way of saying things. And as a matter of fact, even in the Babylonian Talmud, it says that any portion of a day is considered the day and the night of a day. So a portion of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday would be three days and three nights, or three days, depending on whether you're using an idiom or not. So we recognize that God's Word is true, and there's so many more examples of this, and there are places where people are trying to tear apart Scripture and say that it's not true. And I just wanted to go over one of them with you this evening and be very brief. Um, I'm also going to read from uh, 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 30, beginning in verse 12. They also gave him a thick cake and two cakes of raisins, and when he'd eaten, his spirit came back to him, for he had eaten no bread or drunk no water for three days and nights. That would mean the fourth day if it's not an idiom. But then David asked him, To whom do you belong and where are you from? I am a young Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite, he said, and my master abandoned me three days ago. So we see that every time this is used, every time this is used, it's actually an idiom, and it's actually referring to three days, not the fourth day. And so this argument that the scripture is not true falls apart right there. And there's so many more examples of these. And I encourage you, study yourself. Don't be afraid to challenge yourself and see what you find. And it will strengthen your faith as you recognize the 100% accuracy of every word of scripture taken in context. Obviously, if I was talking to someone and I said, she's a brick house. For those who like 70s music, that doesn't mean she's a transformer and she literally turned into a brick house and meant something completely different. We're not going to go into that. Likewise, I could say Andre the Giant ate a horse. He probably literally did not eat a horse, to my knowledge, but he was large enough he probably could eat a significant amount and people would say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, and that may be something that he said. These are examples of idioms, and they are all throughout Scripture as well, so we need to recognize everything in context and not just take one verse out of context, but recognize it in context of all of God's Word, knowing that every archaeological find, 
every time there is an apparent conflict, it has always been resolved. There are many different examples for those who took the epic archaeology class. You see many different examples of archaeology confirming what scripture said when everyone thought it was false in the Tanakh, and then they find it's true. Coming as recently to the lead seals on Mount Ebal, everything, everything in scripture is true in its original context, and we need to study to show ourselves approved to that. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these words, and I ask, Lord God, that you would help me increase my desire to study and show me your words even more and more as I continue to do so. Thank you for this evening, and I ask, Lord God, for a healing of all who are sick, and I just ask, uh, including myself and my family, and I ask that we would meet again next Friday and worship together in your name, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Yid Kedal V'Yid Kedash Me Raba Ba'al Ma Divra Kirote V'Yamlech Machote B'Chayachon U'V'Yamechon U'V'Chayedecho Beit Yisrael Ba'Galam U'V'Zman Kariv V'Imru Amen Yehe Shme Raba Mevarach La'Alam U'Alme Almaya Yid Barach V'Yishtabach V'Yid Pa'ar V'Yid Roman Viet Nase, Viet Adar, Viet Ale, Viet Halal, Shmede Chosha, Brech Hu, Laela, Min Koberchata, Vusharata, Toshbachata, Venechamata, Damiran Baalma, Vaimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, Vachaim Ale Nuval, Kol Yisrael, Vaimru, Amen. O Se Shalom Bim Romav, Hu Yaase Shalom, Aleinu Kol Yisrael, Vaimru. Amen. Yevarechet Adonai, Vayishmorecha. Yair Adonai Panabalecha, Vichonecha. Yes, Adonai, Pana Velecha, Vyasem Laka, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his face upon you, and grant you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace. Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom. Amen.